Hello, Ahmet. Oh, merhaba. Uh, how are you doing? Fine, fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> And how is everything uh, in Indiana? Everything yeah, is yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, thank you very much for attending our session. Uh, 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 thank you for uh, inviting me. Yes, yes, uh, yes, speaker. Yeah, I I hope I do a, uh, an okay job. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. And uh, actually, we are going to start soon, in uh, maybe five minutes. Uh, sure. I think the already time is 1.30, but maybe just uh, wait, we have a break. Actually, we just start the new session right now. Uh, again, uh, Thank you, uh, and uh, you join in the early in the morning. And uh, <laughs> yes, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, it is uh, nice of you to join our uh, conference. Um, actually, you know, uh, Jeffrey Fox also he talked yesterday. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the afternoon. Also, Dr. Omar Rana in the morning uh, from UK. Maybe you you know him. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And he did uh, he his talk in the morning. Then you are also welcome. You are gonna do your talk, and we enjoy your topic. Was very interesting. Also, I I check and I see very good. And um, I hope to actually we have also YouTube stream by the way. We have Zoom, and okay. anybody, for example, can go uh, YouTube stream. And because most of them also join uh, and watch the video through the uh, YouTube live. It's much more coming. Ah. Yeah. Um, How are you doing? Fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. And everything is fine. Uh, then just, um, in, yeah, yeah. Also, we miss Indiana, actually, you know? We like yeah, to, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Well, it's been some time. It's been several years since I've been back to Turkey. We we mm -hmm. had a little place in Çeşme oh, that we would nice. go every summer, uh, but my 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 dad is in his 80s now, so it's a little bit oh, difficult yeah. for him to yeah. travel. So, you are right. well, Bloomington hasn't changed much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, my, I, I forgive me, but my 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 Turkish is just not good. I, when Dad, yeah, when he came over to the states, he married an American and was afraid I wouldn't speak good English. So he very rarely spoke Turkish, and she didn't speak any Turkish. So we actually mostly spoke French <laughs> because yes, yes. my my <laughs> Turkish family went to Les Lise, you know, spoke French. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very very uh, very convoluted conversations. You were uh, Jeffrey Fox's student, or yes. were you? In, yes. Yeah, that's what I remember. Okay. Yes. Uh, and also, he came. He joined the same uh, conference in 2017 in Istanbul. Also, hmm. he was our uh, speaker, and uh, but he also wanted to come, but because of the pandemic, actually, we have to do online. Uh, that was the yeah. reason. Yeah, this is the thing actually, and he enjoyed a lot. Also, he work around uh, the go around the Istanbul and many places and it was good and we had some meeting uh, with also with Tubitak or uh, some institutions and it was very good uh, like a research institute of Turkey uh, Tubitak and we have some meeting in Gebze and it was uh, good but uh, it was also online also the, this time is you know there is no other alternative we yeah unfortunately times actually by the way we postponed the conference But eventually they have to do online because yeah. of the there is no other way. You know, you cannot wait more time to yeah. do a normal conference actually. But it's okay, I'm yeah, fine. Um, okay, maybe we can start first. I will okay. introduce you to our guest. Uh, sure. Thank you very much again, um, uh, Dr. Dalkovic, uh, Mehmet Dalkovic uh, from Indiana University, Bloomington, uh, United States. And we have 
uh, many guests uh, from uh, you know, YouTube channel, most of them, uh, and also we have some guests in Zoom account here. Uh, you can ask any questions uh, after the presentation uh, on the chat, chat uh, panel. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Darkus was born and raised in Texas. He received his undergraduate degree in chemistry and after brief stint in the UI, UI Indiana University, uh, MD, PhD program, biochemistry, graduated with a degree in uh, computer science. He was the first faculty in the Ludis School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering, and is associate professor in the Computing Science Department and adjunct in the Statistics Department. He was the co-author of the Computational Biology Program at IU, Indiana University, as well as the creator of the introduc introductory courses for informatics that approximately 1,400 majors. He is currently the new director of the undergraduate data science program, and he created a dual introductory computer science class that focus on, focuses on the teaching programming through, through analytics in both STEAM and non-STEAM fields, like the science and technology fields or non-STEAM fields. He has graduated five PhD students and works in data science, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, marine ecology, astronomy, material sciences, pedagogy, and does work with Navy. Again, Dr. Dal uh, Dr. Dalkovic, uh, thank you very much for joining our um, conference as a, our guest speaker. Then I will give microphone to you then uh, anybody, any questions, you are welcome to ask uh, through the uh, chat uh, on the Zoom or maybe through the YouTube channel on live stream on YouTube account. Again, again thank you. Please, uh, uh, you can. Sure. Start so, yeah, good night in everyone. Uh, my Turkish is not good, so uh, this will be in uh, uh, English. So my first slide. Uh, my title is long, even though uh, this is supposed to be about higher performance computing, uh, uh, viability of small machines facing big data. And I wanted to show research, current research that we're uh, doing uh, to um, address the problems of big data, um, even with small machines. But I do have a slide or two um, from the architecture where we implemented this initially on IU supercomputer. So I have three students that uh, this work is associated with, uh, Hassan Kurban, who's in the Sirt University in Turkey, uh, Dr. Mark Jenny, who's working with the Navy, and uh, current uh, student Parachit Sharma. And this work has been supported by the uh, National Cancer Institute, uh, NIH. So here is the uh, outline of, of today's talk. I'm gonna give some context and I may spend a little bit more time on the context just because it drives the uh, problem statement. Then we'll talk about the problem statement. Um, I'd like to give a chronology of how this um, story unfolded. Um, and then I'll talk about the solution, uh, what we, um, implemented and are currently into submission for, and then the results and then future work. So one thing that's uh, critical for all of us is a, what I call the era of small data and the era of Z data. The era of small data precedes 2010 and included in this are um, most, if not all the machine language, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms uh, and uh, data reduction techniques. So PCA is 120 years old. And um, right now we're um, in the uh, Zetabyte uh, uh, era, which um, many believe by uh, 2025 will be generating 160 Zetabytes. Um, to give some perspective on that, um, it's claimed that all human speech spoken ever by all of humanity could be captured in 42 zettabytes. Um, what I have below here is um, a snapshot of Feynman's lectures on computation, which I encourage everyone to read. He was a physicist and uh, predicted uh, the quantum computing. But one of the more interesting things that uh, for me and my work 
is his prognostication of what would happen in the future with computation and data. And what he believed was that the movement of the data actually would be the overwhelming um, uh, property of the limit uh, if you divide it into the computing of the data. So eventually what would happen is this would move to zero and we can actually see this in the uh, current uh, change in chips and how much data is being moved. And then I stole from Wikipedia uh, uh, a table giving uh, the sizes of the data. So you can see that the zettabytes are uh, quite enormous. And much of this is attributed to uh, uh, sharing of data. And I'm highlighting this little green um, bar as an example of, of what we might do to the data. So where do these various pieces of data come from? Well, already we have tremendous amounts of data coming in, uh, collecting uh, from uh, uh, commerce or ex uh, scientific experiments. So at CERN, 25 gigabytes per second when they look at particles. The, um, uh, from astronomy, we have uh, pictures of the entire uh, uh, Milky Way. Amazon has 27 million transactions. And only a few years ago, Walmart had a 27, uh, 275 million customers per week. And, and this really begs the question, what do we do with uh, all this data? So what I'm going to do is something um, to, to help explain the intuition. We have this data. And um, I'm with our group, we're really interested in um, iterative algorithms. That is, you have a, a, an objective function, and you send the data uh, cyclically. And traditionally, what happens is the data is sent to the objective function uh, uh, agnostically. That is, it doesn't really matter uh, what the data does. Uh, it's just sent back. So uh, you continually do this until you find some sort of convergence. But the problem is when this data is so large, this cycle becomes inordinately too big. And um, um, as we approach zeta bytes, this, this, this one turn around the circle will, will take too much time. So one approach obviously is high performance computing and that makes sense. But another approach is to look at the data itself. And this is what we've done. So borrowing from uh, our work in uh, computational biology where we look at genes, uh, we decided to uh, see if we could separate data into two kinds of uh, two types, high expressive data and low expressive data. Low, high expressive data is data that changes the objective function dramatically, and low expression data doesn't change the data um, um, dramatically. So what we would like to do is as we cycle, we would like to only send the high expression data to the objective function and skip over the low expression data. So then this begs the question, how do you determine these and uh, do these change? So the, the first answer is uh, we use uh, a combinatoric structure to do that. And the second question is um, based on properties of this combinatoric structure, uh, we find that um, most of the, the data uh, becomes low expression eventually and settles upon a um, state that we uh, converge on. So we actually ignore the objective function and only look at the uh, uh, data separator. So one can imagine uh, uh, these two types of data as uh, a graph. I have low expression data up here and high expression data. And what we found through many, many experiments is that uh, the flow is typically from high expression to low expression. There is a little bit of flow from low expression to high expression, but this is how we converge. And the structure, as I said, uh, is a combinatoric in particular. It's a heap. And what we found is that the heap is a very nice way to separate the data. What we do is leverage something from the heap that we identified that I'll talk in a few moments, but this heap is able to separate the high expression data from the low expression. And I've 
I've illustrated this as a cartoon where I'm not really sending the low expression data anymore to the objective function. I'm only sending the high expression. So this data separator is insinuated inside the function, uh, uh, inside the, the loop. And this holds the data that we send and then we converge actually on the structure. We don't converge on the objective function. So just as a, a, a completeness for sense of completeness, this is a taxonomy of all the reduction techniques that we could find. I'm not, uh, I don't wanna scare anyone. I'm not gonna talk about this, but there have been many, many, many reduction techniques and we're gonna be focusing on clustering. So uh, uh, with respect to that, I would like to draw your attention to what we identify as in situ and ex situ. So we borrowed the Latin. Uh, our algorithm is in situ. So our data reduction technique actually works within the algorithm. These other techniques work outside the algorithm. So for instance, PCA, which is 120 years old, which uh, came into existence before computing, um, is disconnected really with the algorithm. So uh, if you employ it, you have to employ the PCA, then run your algorithm, then go back and see if it makes sense. And if it doesn't, then redo PCA. And PCA often uh, fails to really capture uh, what we want. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, two algorithms uh, in particular. These are two of the, uh, well, K-means is the oldest, probably one of the oldest artificial intelligence algorithms and then expectation maximization. Um, they're so popular, they have Wikipedia pages and one can uh, look at K-means as an instance of expectation maximization. And I'm gonna give both algorithms and then say what we did for both. So here's the pathway of the work that we did. We started uh, with uh, uh, creating a k-means, which I'll talk about, a parallel k-means using these uh, heaps. And that led to a little bit of work with our uh, red R RF trees. This master student um, um, went to Yale. Uh, we implemented uh, our algorithm finally in uh, Python for EM because that's what I had my site set upon. EM is, again, uh, includes k-means. Then we implemented this in, in R and this is under submission right now. So um, in R, our, our package uh, does a traditional EM and then what we call EM star, which uses uh, heaps. And this is a discussion really about um, improving the runtime of uh, EM by uh, separating uh, the high expression data from the low expression data. Just as a fun, uh, fun side note, here are our downloads uh, once we released our package. And at this point, uh, someone in the UK, whom I don't know, had a warning uh, pop up from uh, a round off error using a, a floor function. So uh, CRAN asked us to uh, withdraw our package. We fixed it and then the downloads uh, started uh, pouring in again. So um, we think this is a nice indication that the package is working pretty well. So there are, are three things that are happening here and I, and I wanna make sure that it's not too confusing. So there's k-means and expectation maximization. We created a k-mean star and an e em star, but all this work actually began with implementing uh, this a notion uh, that, and we called it at the time paraheap K. So we took uh, K pipe, uh, we took K means and added our um, uh, structure to it and then uh, compared it to K, K pipe pipe, which is an extension of K means. Uh, as I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, uh, K, K means uh, plus plus uh, um, is the foundation for K pipe pipe it uh, focuses on the seeding. And um, for all these uh, pieces of work, we did, we did um, exploration on both real world and synthetic data, uh, looking at the three elements of, of data, scale, dimension, and separability. So how this work began is there was a first call from computer uh, 
IEEE computer and con uh, computational astronomy. I sit on a, a few, I sat on a few committees, PhD committees, and I thought maybe we should just try to cluster the Milky Way. As I said, there's a lot of data coming in from uh, uh, terrestrial and non-terrestrial uh, 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 collectors for data. And the idea is that uh, we would like to uh, look at the st uh, stars and decide what part of what's called the galactic component gave uh, rise to them. So even though we're clustering, we can find whether our clustering is uh, correct. So here's a better example. And I drew all these pictures, by the way. So that's why I don't have any links. Uh, uh, this one is from the, the paper itself. So this is pre-cluster. And you can see the galactic components. And this is post-cluster. And so we're figuring out which star uh, belonged to which cluster. And our, our goal was to um, do this efficiently. So before I continue, uh, I want to change a little bit of the terminology because it's often confusing to say cluster because it can be used as a verb or it can be the cluster with inside the cluster. Um, so I want to use the mathematical description of partition, which is um, a, a collection of subsets whose union is the original set. They're pairwise disjoint. Um, uh, they're not empty, and uh, each of these is called a block. So the question that uh, we wanted to answer is, could we partition the Milky Way uh, such that each star belonged to its proper galactic block? And our answer uh, after uh, some time was yes, we could do this. And then our next step was to generalize uh, this process to work for uh, uh, expectation maximization. So just a little bit of background about k-means and Gaussian mixture. K-means is 60 years old, and it's what's called a hard clustering algorithm. So each datum is associated to one block. Um, and typically, uh, we either the, the, the best representative of a block is called a metoid or a centroid. And most of the time, people use a simple average, uh, although one can imagine using other types of best representatives. Um, and the algorithm, which I'll show, uh, uh, converges. Uh, you recalculate the convergence by averaging um, uh, all the data and then find the data that's nearest to the centroid, which is the K, because uh, in general, brute force makes this um, um, uh, too, too complex to, to run feasibly. Uh, it grows uh, uh, faster, I think, than the Sterling numbers. Then EM is an, really a broader, um, a broader implementation of this k-means where each data is uh, generated by a Gaussian. Um, and so what you want to do is associate uh, the data with actually every Gaussian. So it's a soft clustering. And then you recalculate the proper pro properties of the Gaussians and the iterate until convergence. These both uh, converge, but uh, the rate of convergence often is problematic. And both of these have a, a very difficult element to deal with uh, that we'll talk about. So here is, uh, again, because we began uh, the work um, uh, trying to cluster the Milky Way, we wanted to look at uh, what people had done at that time. And uh, probably the most popular k-means um, still is probably k-means plus plus. And this work, uh, what they do is instead of attacking the algorithm, they attack the first part of the algorithm, which is seeding the centroids. So there's, uh, it's, it's problematic from a computer scientist uh, viewpoint because always when you add choice to an algorithm, it means that it's non-deterministic. So this uh, um, uh, seeding uh, uses uh, a distribution that's imputed from the data. Then uh, Bauman uh, later parallelized this and used the same uh, approach for seeding. So this really was our uh, gold standard that we wanted to compare to. There are other methods of improving uh, k-means, but this one is the one we liked. Uh, and then there's the tri triangle inequality that captures the distance bounds. Um, 
Hammerly and Drake in 2014 actually uh, talked about triangle inequality and, and coincidentally at the same time, the same year when they published their work uh, with ours, uh, they used um, uh, some heaps, uh, mostly as priority cues to capture the upper bound and lower bound of where the points were lying on the centroid. But um, K-means still is usually one of the first choices and it's found in many, many, packages uh, across the AI and machine learning landscape. So uh, this talk wouldn't be uh, complete if I, if I didn't talk about uh, unsupervised and then supervised and then um, uh, um, uh, reinforcement learning. So we are in here unsupervised. And while it's the simplest uh, uh, machine learning and AI to, to understand. It has no real theoretical foundation to stand upon. So uh, there's a lot of uh, engineering and working under the hood to get it to work. And I think this speaks to why K-means is still used after 60 years. It's, it's simple to understand and it's simple to implement. But that again also speaks to um, its weakness that uh, it's often domain driven. So you have to understand the data that you're clustering. And uh, the idea, I stole this from the Latin, the idea of, that we cluster is that uh, things that belong to the same cluster, if they share some properties, they share others. So for instance, if Amazon does uh, its recommendation system, it has a cross product of items that it might cluster versus a cross product of people that they cluster. And at each index, they would give, let's say some uh, positive fraction. And so then you get that ad in your, uh, browser when you look. So here is the uh, k-means and I took the liberty of making it uh, object oriented. So we have the k which helps us uh, limit the search space. We have data and then our epsilon is how uh, precise do we want our uh, uh, centroids to be. So we have a set of these are the representatives of the, the data and then each data each centroid has its mean and the data that belongs to it. So this is the real crux of the problem. We have to randomly initialize these. So what this means is um, you can't simply run uh, uh, k-means once. You have to run it many times because these best representatives might be, uh, you might take the data or you might take a uniform distribution or you might do as k++ does, impute a distribution where uh, these let's say are as far apart as possible. And we have two steps. We uh, gather the data, the uh, data that's nearest to the centroid, K of them. And then here we recalculate what the uh, mean is. And then we repeat this until our means uh, 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 don't seem to change much. And I'm putting this expectation maximization because this is really uh, um, an instance of EM. Uh, here, um, the, the, the data only belongs to one of the uh, uh, centroids. And there's many elements here that aren't discussed that uh, if you implement this, you have to worry about. So for instance, there are ties and that adds some non-determinism. Also, the centroids themselves can collapse. So you uh, typically have to decide whether you're uh, protocol is to maintain K or uh, allow uh, K to, let's say, decrease. Uh, you might use uh, KD trees to, to do that. So our attack uh, is on the data size, as I said, as I began. And here's the runtime. Um, it's interesting to read old papers about k-means because they said it was linear with uh, uh, the size of the data. but uh, as we move into zettabytes, really there are lots of uh, data elements that uh, we have to worry about. Uh, we have the iteration because as I said, uh, k-means sometimes doesn't converge as fast as we hope. Uh, here's the data size and then the k itself would seem to be trivial, but in this age of uh, big data, we may have k's that um, span in, in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. So for instance, if you work in uh, computational biology, um, I have two students working in what's called single cell RNA-seq, where 
each cell is barcoded. And then within each cell are a set of probes that have uh, gene expressions that can measure the amount of RNA. So uh, if we have 30,000 cells, you can imagine that the, the table is quite wide. <laughs> and then uh, D is the dimension of the data. Again, this is getting very big. And as we know, uh, as D becomes large, we suffer from, <clears throat> excuse me, the curse of dimensionality where uh, far and near be, uh, collapse. And uh, this happens, uh, unfortunately, to all algorithms. So let's look at um, uh, measuring just uh, uh, the value of the centroid. So here's the data that belongs to one of the centroids. And what we can do is show that, uh, indeed, if you take the intra block uh, distance uh, with a little bit of linear algebra, you can show that it actually uh, is equivalent to uh, finding the sum of the difference between the best representative, the mean here, and the data. So, so this is a nice thing to assure yourself that uh, this best representative makes uh, sense. So if we look at this uh, uh, measure a little bit more closely, though, what we, can, what we can do is take our notion earlier of low expression data, high expression data, and separate them out. So in this side is the low expression data. So what this would say is this is the data that doesn't really affect my convergence much. Uh, um, you can think of this, um, it's somewhat unintuitive initially, but this is the data that actually is, is good. And when we first started writing this, we call this the good data, um, but we quickly realized that was uh, putting too much uh, emphasis uh, on the data uh, with, with, with good. Uh, this is the data that is nearest to the average. And this high expression data is the data that changes the objective function greatly. So this is what we uh, were calling bad data, but we're not gonna say good and bad because we don't want to uh, be um, politically incorrect and make the data feel bad. But the idea is that if somehow we could separate these two and work on mostly the high expression data, um, hopefully if this is a significant portion of the low express uh, of the total data, then we can speed up our algorithm. So here is our statement. We wanted to improve k-means and in particular look at our first problem, this uh, uh, clustering the Milky Way. And then we had our sights on generalizing this for um, other algorithms and algorithms in particular uh, uh, EM. Um, this is a very important point here is that data changes as it's used. And we know this uh, from Cod's work uh, back in the 70s. And he, uh, when he began his work on uh, communication, he developed uh, a work uh, by others, but uh, put it in a form that, that we know it today as entropy. Um, where the data is measured by its association with a, a probability distribution. And the idea is if something is low probability, it has high entropy and so is worth many bits. If it has uh, high entropy, it's uh, common and has low bits. And now this is effectively what we use for networking. Uh, uh, the problem here though is that uh, as we're iterating through k-means, we don't really have a probability distribution that we can look at uh, so um, while we uh, are aware that data is changing in its effectiveness or expressiveness, as we're calling it, we had to figure out a way to um, uh, dichotomize this. So again, I'm, I'm showing the same picture um, and reminding you, so low expression data is data that uh, typically won't affect your uh, objective function and high expression data uh, will affect it significantly. And there is a flow, obviously, but what we found is the flow uh, typically goes from high expression to low expression. And we captured this in the, the heap that we looked at. So I think it's important to talk about failures as much as successes. Uh, and we did try to use uh, entropy initially uh, as we competed against k -pi pipe that didn't work. We used uh, item set, which uses the a priori algorithm. 
uh, that failed. We used triangulation that failed. And then we we discovered heaps. And I will talk a little bit about heaps. But uh, to wrap up the work on the, the initial paper, because it's just a sort of a prelude to what we did. Um, here is our initial implementation on a supercomputer uh, parallel heap K on 910 a thousand stellar objects, then 95 million. And then we implemented K, uh, K pi pipe ourselves and it failed to converge within uh, 24 hours on the, the supercomputer. Um, we found uh, uh, some uh, difficulty where uh, the distribution that imputed really uh, wasn't able to converge as quickly because the data, um, we don't have a formal description of it, but we call it thick. That is, everything was sort of near everything. So uh, it cycled a lot. And because it's a high performance computing conference, I just wanted to show we, we did have an architecture and we uh, did implement this on uh, the supercomputer that is just being retired. I use getting a new supercomputer, which is exciting. Um, to uh, finish uh, the K means, we did many experiments looking at other data too, and we found that. Um, uh, data didn't visit the nodes in um, uh, arbitrarily, that uh, the, the data uh, naturally split itself into high expression and low expression data. So here were the questions we were asking, how many times did the data appear in the leaf nodes? And as a teaser, I will tell you that the leaf nodes actually re reflect uh, the high expression data. So the higher up in the, the heap, the lower expression of the data is. And so what we discovered was that in the leaves, not only was uh, did we have high expression data, but we believe uh, that's where noise uh, resided. So um, as I said, k-means, uh, 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 we improved it using this, this approach, but our sites were set on EM. So we looked at EM and we have a publication on this, uh, uh, both in a conference and a journal. Um, our idea was to take uh, the work that we did in k-means, uh, not the parallelization, but using the heaps and uh, see if we could do the same thing. And we're going to refer to the traditional EM as EMT. So here's the expectation maximization. It's uh, described many where, uh, many places, but oftentimes it's a little bit abstruse because of the um, uh, mathematically the way it's described. But it's a it's a pretty simple algorithm. Um, part of that is due to some uh, mathematics that's done to make it easy, which I'm not going to show here. But uh, uh, again, we have data uh, k. Uh, and our epsilon, which is our, our accuracy. So we have to randomly initialize uh, means, and then we have to uh, uh, initialize uh, covariance matrix, and then uh, 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 priors. So there's a lot of initialization here. Then we have two steps. We have the expectation step and maximization step. In the expectation step, we uh, uh, what we do is find the probability that uh, that belong that each data belongs to each Gaussian process, K Gaussian process. So uh, we just simply normalize that, and then the maximization step is um, we aggr we we aggregate or amortize each of the uh, data to. Uh, calculate a new mean, a new covariance, and then a new prior. And we do this until our mathematical objective function is achieved. So here's the uh, ugly runtime of this uh, expectation maximization. And all I want to draw your attention to is in the E step, there are lots of things that they don't talk about. So uh, inverting the covariance matrix and, and computing things are uh, fraught with many dangers, uh, uh, singular matrices, et cetera. But what, what we really are doing is focusing on this N and we're separating the data uh, from the traditional EM that uses all the data versus using the high expression data. And um, as I said before, using some uh, uh, 
uh, probably third semester calculus and some linear algebra, you can find that uh, you can estimate the mean and covariance by uh, simply taking the uh, mean and then calculating the covariance. So here what I wanted to do was to show you a very simple example of expectation maximization on three data points. So I started with uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, and 5, 1. I made it simple so I knew that uh, EM would converge and how the initial uh, description of the algorithm, it didn't really describe what uh, to take as the uh, initialization. So we just take the first two data points as uh, initialization of the means. And then each step um, I labeled um, in um, R uh, 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 where the next mean was calculated. So you can see after five iterations, uh, the mean that started at this data point converged to uh, 5, 1, and then this data uh, mean, this mean started at this data point, converged to about halfway in between. Why that's important is uh, that will uh, give you an indication of what the uh, covariance matrix will look like, because that ends up being a kind of history of the migration of where this uh, data is and then what it includes. So this mean uh, believes that these two data points uh, belong to it, and then this mean believes this single data point belongs to it uh, because I had k as two. So uh, what did, how did we use the heaps and what are heaps? Uh, probably most of you know, but if, if, if you don't, uh, it is a, a combinatoric structure that is um, uh, pretty old itself too. Uh, uh, created by Williams uh, in 64, so almost 50 years ago. The most interesting thing about it is uh, that on time, uh, uh, it has some very nice constant times. Insertion and finding min are on average constant. And again, uh, this is done with, I think, relatively small heaps. It, it would be interesting to start looking at uh, enormous heaps in the zettabyte size, but probably something uh, uh, related to this by a constant would be true. Heaps are basically uh, balanced binary trees that uh, possess what's called a heap property. A min heap is such that the parent is always less than the child. And then the max heap is that the parent is always greater than the child. So when you insert uh, a node, what you do is reorganize uh, the heap so it's balanced and maintains uh, these heap properties. So uh, as we were looking at heaps, um, we identified a new property that we call strong and weak. And this has to do with uh, permutation of levels. And what we found was that um, uh, these two different types of uh, properties um, uh, were related to uh, high expression and low expression data. So it's strong means that you can permute from the top to any uh, level L uh, from the root to any level L, and it maintains the heap property. Weak means um, from the level L below, it loses the heap property. And these act as semi monotonic um, 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 properties. That is, most of the time, if you have all the data, uh, this will continue. So, here using the previous examples I'm showing you, uh, this is a weak heap right here, because if I swap five and two, I, I uh, break the heap property. Um, the other intuition to give you is that for k-means, we use a min heap because this represents distance. For em, we, re we use a max heap because we're using probability. So uh, at the top would be the, uh, how strongly is it associated? So here is a, a completely strong heap. So if I permute any, any row, uh, the heap maintains its heap property. And here, um, if I just change two values, the strong portion of the heap remains, but from, from uh, this level on, it becomes weak. So what this means is if this data is likely the most data, uh, the data that will change uh, the objective function. 
Our stopping criteria is uh, unusual too. Our stopping criteria is actually on the heaps, not on the objective function anymore. So we look at hamming distance of the leaves and we give some per, uh, percent change. So not only is this novel in terms of separating the data with the heaps, but our stopping condition down now doesn't uh, rely upon uh, uh, the mathematical precision of E, it simply looks at how much data has stopped trafficking between uh, the heaps. And uh, to uh, further uh, make us comfortable, we, we discovered that as the heaps become larger and larger, the uh, strong heaps uh, become vanishingly small. This helps us uh, establish uh, this, again, this monotonicity of, of using uh, the strong heaps. Here, this is taken from the, the k-means, but uh, k-means star, excuse me, uh, and to show you uh, a breakdown of where data uh, 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 resides. So, in, and I'll talk about each of these, uh, hopefully, uh, with the time that I have left since I started at uh, 6.30, but some data never uh, resides in the leaves, some data only once, some data most of the time, and then some data all the time. So you can see that this data here really is what would be uh, high expression data and what we should be focusing on. And uh, for most of the work that we've done, we found that uh, focusing on this uh, speeds up the EM tremendously. So just to recap, the low expression data is associated with the strong heap and the high expression data is associated with the weak heap. And there is a tendency for the high expression data to, to be associated with the correct heap and becomes low expression data. Um, this again is from uh, experiments. When we looked at it, we found uh, a, a 1 million random heaps, 95% uh, 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 of the high expression data uh, uh, resides in the, 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 the trees. Again, more experiments. I'm an experimentalist. So um, uh, what we're doing here is increasing the fraction of low expression data. And as you can see, this side is the top of the heap. This is the bottom of the heap. And as we increase the uh, mixture, we find that the high expression data uh, always falls to the, to, to the leaves. So the work on speeding up um, EM has been mostly done by statisticians and mostly they focus on model-based types of uh, improvements, which means they're interested in sampling and looking at, let's say, uh, uh, the convergence. So we are outside of the, the uh, typical type of approximations. If you're interested, this is probably one of the uh, best papers uh, by Wu on the convergence of uh, EM algorithms. So forgive me on this slide. I know it's terribly busy. Um, I, I will only point out a couple of things that will uh, be critical for uh, uh, this talk. So now what we've done is added actual heaps. And each heap uh, is a now not a covering like the uh, 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 Gaussians were with the data, it is an actual partition. So each data belongs to one and only one heap and um, uh, everything else remains the same. So what we do is we start off with the original data. So all the data we assume is high expression. And then here, what we do is uh, again, calculate the responsibility uh, uh, probability. Then we build the heaps. So we insert into the heaps uh, 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 the data and find its maximum uh, uh, probability because this would give us an indication of its expressiveness. And then we do the maximization element with the high expression data. So um, uh, we end up breaking um, uh, the probabilities as they uh, were normally envisioned, but uh, weight uh, things uh, uh, disproportionately by the high expression data than, uh, than all the data itself. And then here, this step is that we re-obtain uh, the uh, 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 
reobtain the uh, 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 leaves for the uh, new structures. Uh, I, I will uh, I will answer that uh, minimal spanning tree. Yeah, in a moment. Uh, so here is uh, uh, again the same data set implemented with uh, EM star. So as you can see, it uh, stops. It converges into three spots, and um, uh, the reason why it stops is because so early is because one of the data becomes low expression. So, uh, uh, and this is because it's so small and we'll see evidence of this. Uh, this is not unlike many um, speed ups for most algorithms that on tiny data, the speed ups actually don't do uh, as, as accurately uh, uh, as well as the normal algorithm, but this will at least uh, give you some idea about how quickly it, it, it stops. So this is a horrible picture, but let me explain what's going on these boxes represent the original data that we started with. And then these arrows point to EM, traditional EM. And then these arrows point to EM star. So this makes sense for the covariance because EM is trying to cover both of these data. So it's very flat. And uh, the other uh, covariance is trying to not only cover its data but where it began, whereas EM star is much more generous with its uh, uh, area of where it says things belong. So um, uh, this gives you an idea about uh, the differences between EM and, and EM star. Now, as we increase the data size, the, the accuracy becomes uh, almost indistinguishable, but on small data sizes, it's a little bit uh, fat. So here is um, a uh, comparison of what some of the most common ER packages that have EM on it. And most of these employ uh, model-based approaches where they do sampling. And so uh, what I wanna end up doing, this is a high-performance computing conference. My last, second to last slide will be the final uh, push of what I'm talking about. Uh, but we did this with uh, various types of data comparing EM and EM star. Uh, with the breast cancer data. So the red is the traditional EM and the blue is our EM star. And as you can see, the accuracy is essentially the same, but uh, we perform quite uh, uh, better in terms of uh, training time and a number of clusters, uh, fewer iterations uh, and uh, training time. So we looked at uh, other types of problems, census data. So we're increasing the data and keeping the features uh, uh, about the same. Again, uh, when it's small, there's not much difference. Uh, but as we increase the number of clusters, uh, EM uh, starts uh, lagging seriously behind. And as we increase the clusters, again, this is uh, likely due to even with this small size of uh, cursive dimensionality. Then uh, this experiment is spam based. Um, um, it has uh, not that much data, but a lot of features. And so we were curious how we would perform. Interestingly, um, we were able to do quite well uh, uh, in this case. And again, this points to my earlier comment that uh, the domain really matters for these algorithms. Uh, you can't be uh, agnostic about the kind of data you're looking at, especially if you uh, blindly use uh, uh, Euclidean distance. But again, we are uh, faster, fewer uh, number of iterations and number of uh, clusters. Uh, here's ringworm data. And this began with um, um, an examination of, of what are called these ARC classifiers. Uh, which uh, uh, it's, it, it's an acronym for adapt, adaptively resampling and combining, where you sample and you weight uh, uh, these uh, ensembles. Um, uh, so we thought it would be interesting just to compare. Um, we do quite well. Accuracy uh, ends up being uh, about the same. And uh, uh, EM star seems to be doing uh, a great job. Now, uh, what we wanted to do was use some synthetic data uh, because uh, oftentimes the real data obviously is biased towards uh, the type of information. And we found that 
uh, as we increase the number of clusters, the number of data. So here we have 3 million data points um, and the number of dimensions that uh, EM star performs quite well. And as you can see, as we uh, move into a uh, very modest number of dimensions, even 450, uh, there's still a problem of cursive dimensionality, which is one of the next tasks for us to attack. Then what we wanted to do uh, to keep ourselves honest was compare with other packages. And this is in no way uh, uh, stating that the packages aren't excellent. All these R packages are wonderful, but we just wanted to ensure the, the readers and users that we didn't do something special with our package. So um, uh, we, uh, this is just a part of some of the experiments we did, but um, number of clusters and number of data size, and we stopped after two hours of, 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 uh, of uh, iterations. So uh, as you can see, uh, EM cluster, which is probably the most popular, um, uh, iterated the most um, mixed tools uh, failed to converge. So we compared it to, to both these. And then again, we used uh, large data. So we found that uh, neither mixed tools nor EM cluster uh, converged at all. Uh, as the data got very large and people like EM, it's easy to understand. And so um, we're seeing that we're able to cluster uh, quite a large number of data points. So uh, again, I, uh, this is a high performance computing conference. And uh, I said my second to last slide would uh, say something. All of this was run on a tiny laptop. Uh, so two, two cores, uh, very slow speed with 16 gigabytes of main memory. So that's why uh, uh, I say uh, there's a, a fair amount of work to be done, uh, probably not simply on the data, but uh, looking at data expressiveness with high performance computing, because if we're able to achieve this kind of speed up with uh, something that's a, not a high performance computing uh, structure, we should be able to leverage this uh, expressiveness with high performance. So um, our future work is to parallelize and distribute the heat-based optimization. Uh, this is not a trivial task, um, um, uh, uh, but uh, we're interested in doing this um, mostly to attack the problem of dimensionality. Uh, uh, we want to add to our package the k-mean star, which we have not done. And this was implemented in Python 2.7, which now is woefully out of date with 3.8 and 3.9 coming down upon us. So we would like to uh, uh, make this available. And we've had uh, many, many downloads of our uh, Python version. So I will uh, end here and uh, uh, try to answer any questions. Um, uh, so I've got some questions here, I guess. Uh, let me look at the first one. Yes, uh, related please, to cluster. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, the yeah. algorithm is based, uh, uh, it takes long on large concept you mentioned to improve the processing time. Yes, we looked at minimum spanning trees and uh, 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 the minimal spanning tree doesn't have uh, the, um, uh, nice properties of the heap because we use uh, we use a, a fair amount of all of these products. So uh, to uh, 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 search our heap and to uh, find the minimum, for instance, the minimum in the finding of the leaves, it's very fast. So uh, because this is an array, we can simply just have a pointer to uh, let's say half half the array which in a heap, if it, obviously it's kept in main memory as an array, so it's very fast. But a minimal spanning tree certainly uh, is an approach. Um, yes, there is, uh, I absolutely agree with you. Um, there is a, a change of focus uh, completely from unsupervised to uh, supervised. And um, we can see uh, this approach, I, I would say in arc classifiers, or ADA boost in some sense uh, where uh, they, they weight the um, uh, uh, coefficients of the voting. Um, um, so uh, 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 
I, 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 but uh, I, I would say there still needs to be a fair amount of, of work on the unsupervised symptoms since it's um, 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 a more basic question to ask how, how do two things belong. Um, uh, we, we are interested in, in improving uh, deep learning algorithms. Uh, uh, we, we, we have started some work on that, but, um, and uh, I have a paper with uh, a fellow colleague, David Leake, uh, on uh, Siamese networks, but it's uh, unclear uh, unraveling these uh, neural networks, uh, what exactly, how we could exactly put in these combinatoric structures. So the rule of thumb in computational biology anyway is that um, combinatoric structures allow for much faster processing, but unfortunately you generate too much data. On the other hand, statistics uh, gives us very precise answers, but it takes a long time. So our idea was to uh, improve this uh, statistical approach uh, by uh, inserting these heaps into, uh, I'm sorry, let me get back to uh, the questions, uh, inserting these combinatorics to uh, improve the speed. So I hope that was an, an okay answer. Any other questions? I hope I didn't go over time. <laughs> oh, uh, you're, you're muted, Ahmed. Uh... We have a, another question. Uh, sure. Kemal Ebjolu, right? Uh, did you get the question, Doctor? Uh, uh, I'm looking. Uh, I I. Uh, I think you already answered it. Yes. Yes. Kemal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then I think we have one more question. Okay. I have a question, but I am uh, just, I, I like- Yeah, to please ask. ask. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. It was actually excellent talk. Then uh, we have some, uh, now it is a question, but first I will ask my question. Now uh, for high expression and low expression data, now when we categorize, can we categorize any type of data to have a high expression and low expression or are there any limitations? So. Uh, that's a great question, and we've been working on that. Um, I began, uh, we began honestly um, um, experimentally. So this was more of an intuition than a formal notion. And so um, where we started looking is uh, probably a little bit counterintuitive, but we've been looking at minimization of energy, uh, uh, leveraging some of the work of Lipinoff functions. So the idea is that um, the low energy seems to reside near stable chaotic systems and the high energy around the, the uh, not near the stable condition. So um, our, our, our work uh, right now is how to uh, uh, perhaps let's say take Boltzmann's energy and um, uh, take a heap and uh, see if we can characterize this uh, rather than doing it by uh, uh, simply looking at the objective function. So um, it, it, I think it's a very deep question and it, uh, uh, the answer uh, has not come to us uh, quite just yet, uh, but we're trying many different approaches. And this I think is one of the challenges for the uh, neural networks is that it's um, the, even though it has the same kind of, um, if I can put down the picture, uh, neural networks have the same kind of descent. And this is why the statisticians actually look at, you know, Newton Raphson and, and, and try to skip steps. Uh, certainly there has to be something happening here, uh, uh, separating, separating the data, but where exactly in the uh, neural net that would occur and at what iterations, uh, we're just quite not sure yet. Uh, so uh, probably we have to do uh, some, really some uh, more exp uh, experimentation, uh, seeing if we can even, uh, I, I, if the separation is, is strong. As I showed in, in the, this picture of experimentation, 
um, yeah. here uh, as we add as we add uh, mixtures of high expression and low expression data, it seems to separate out. But um, I, I don't know if this holds in general. I'm typically very skeptical of uh, uh, stuff until I have uh, at least a somewhat quantitative idea about what's going on. Um, thank you, Doctor. We have one more question. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to repeat? Uh, uh, or just you can. Is it the last one about the? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, what, what, what? You, the, it's an excellent question, uh, and this comes to 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 this uh, um, uh, observation that. Uh, when you have a when you when you optimize something, uh, uh, there seems to be a way, at least in this in this instance, to separate data that uh, uh, doesn't really change your optimization much from data that changes your optimization much. So what we did was observe <laughs> very uh, innocently that the average uh, seemed to be a good point of separation. So. Uh, what we did was for uh, k-means, uh, uh, for example, we said, well, uh, let's look at stuff that's far away from the average and assume that that's high expression data. But what we found from um, subsequent experiments too, that this high uh, the high expression data uh, may contain actually valuable signals that are simply just, uh, there's too many of them and additionally uh, contains noise. So even within this high expression data, I would say there is, uh, if I can uh, abuse my own terminology, there might be low expression, high expression data and high expression, high expression data. So that might be the, the, the really uh, high expression, high expression data may be noise where uh, the data simply uh, uh, doesn't belong or might be an outlier or simply uh, resides on the edge of, 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 of these uh, uh, clusters or partitions. And so there's no uh, fixed way to um, decide where it belongs. And then the rest of this may be signals. So um, this is actually one of the approaches that uh, EM cluster takes. They actually do hierarchical agglomerative clustering before they do EM. So that's why they uh, get, I think, some fast speed up, uh, which is a very clever approach. So you pre-process your clustering with, with faster clustering. And then uh, I think what they're doing is doing what eventually we're doing, but in a, in a different way. They're, they're separating the, 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 the data, uh, uh, perhaps not uh, by high expression, low expression, but they're providing the, the EM with uh, uh, the clusters that are uh, more likely to be true than than simply uh, uh, starting off flat like we do. Okay, Doctor, thank you very much. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, it was wonderful uh, talk actually, and from both channel, from Zoom and YouTube channel, also there are the guests are just uh, following the presentation. Uh, and if you don't have, do you have anything to say, Dr. Dalkovich? Uh, uh, ladder, I guess, would be yeah, yeah. my... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for joining early in the morning. Uh, yes, absolutely. Indiana Bloomington, 6.30 in the morning. And I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate your <laughs> time for early morning. And it was uh, nice of you to join our uh, conference and do this talk. And well, thank you for inviting me. It's an excellent yeah. conference. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And, thank and you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. you. And I, I'm probably going to uh, muck around with the other uh, salons too. So uh, yeah. I'm yes. awake now. Four <laughs> cups of coffee. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.